Well, hello. We're going to spend a few minutes just to talk about how you interpret the SPSS output for the chi-square goodness of fit test. As you're aware, the chi-square goodness of fit test is applied when we're working with nominal uh, variables. Uh, specifically, we mean that the uh, possible uh, values for the variable are categorical and cannot be ranked. When we're going to use a chi-square goodness of fit uh, test, there are some basic requirements that we need to make sure that we've met in order for anything that we find to be of value to us. Number one, the sample had to have been randomly drawn from the population. And by this, uh, what is meant is that the sample is representative of the population. That's going to be important if we hope to generalize our results from the sample to the entire population. Number two, the values for the variable are mutually exclusive. By this, I mean that uh, if our variable, for example, was uh, do you work, uh, the values for that variable could be yes and no. And those two values for the variable, do you work, yes and no, uh, they would fulfill this requirement in terms of being mutually exclusive. That is, either someone works or they don't. Uh, they couldn't do both. So our values for the variables must be mutually exclusive. Finally, our third requirement is that the minimum expectation of five uh, occurrences in each category. And let's uh, take a moment to look at that. Uh, in terms of our variable, do you work? And we'll actually be looking at this particular variable for this um, presentation. But for this variable, do you work? The values were yes and no. And those values represent category. So we have a yes category and a no category. And this third requirement says that you have to expect at least five people for each category. So if I, for example, interviewed ten people, I would need to expect five people to say yes, I work, and five people to say no. Um, if for some reason the expectation of uh, how many people would expect to say uh, yes or say no, that is the number of people would expect to pick each particular value, if that should ever drop below 5, then the chi-square goodness of fit would not be as appropriate, perhaps as another statistical test, and the results may not be as valid. And we'll talk a little bit more about this as we go along. Well, uh, for this scenario, let's say we surveyed 20 students about whether they work. And in terms of our first requirement to do a chi-square goodness of fit test, we'll say that the sample was randomly drawn from the population. That is, our sample is representative of the population, and it would therefore be appropriate to generalize from the sample to the population as a whole. Our uh, survey, uh, let's say, had a question on it, uh, do you work, with the possible responses yes uh, and no. Uh, in terms of the second requirement for the goodness of fit test, these two uh, responses to the question do you work, yes and no, they are mutually exclusive. That is, someone would not select both of them. They would select one or the other. Then we have our null hypothesis. And the null hypothesis specifies the expected frequency for each category. So we interviewed uh, 20 people. And our null hypothesis then is what, um, what would be expected uh, in terms of number of people who would say yes and number of people who would say no. Let's say an instructor, in terms of assigning homework, uh, has an assumption that, well, only half the students work. Uh, the other half don't, and so, you know, there's no reason to go, you know, any lighter on homework, per se, because, you know, at least half the students aren't working. That might then be the null hypothesis. And, of course, the students in the class might be saying, well, hey, a lot of us work. Uh, and if that's the case, that would be the, the research hypothesis. So no hypothesis uh, would be the assumption, oh, only half students work. And the research hypothesis might be the students saying, oh, no, 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 no. more than half of us uh, work. Um, certainly, it's not only half of us who work. With the research hypothesis, we look at the observed frequency. That is, we, for example, hand out a survey and then we observe what the responses will be. So uh, right now, you see question marks under the observed for yes, the observed for no, because the survey 
hasn't yet been handed out. Okay, here you're taking a look at the uh, at the chi-square output, and of course in the SPSS Basics book it will show you the step-by-step -step process to get this chi-square output. But for now we're just going to look and focus on the chi-square output itself. And looking at it, you'll see that there's two tables. Uh, the top table uh, shows us our descriptive statistics. That is, it helps us to describe the results for our particular sample. And you can see that 16 people said that uh, they work, and only four people said that they do not work. So our null hypothesis with that was that it's going to be a 50-50, uh, 10 saying yes, 10 saying no. And what we observed certainly did not match up with what was expected based upon the null hypothesis. The bottom table is the inferential statistics. That is, well, this difference that we observed between, um, between the observed and the expected, this difference that we found, should we generalize from our sample to the entire population? That's what the inferential statistics is all about. You know, perhaps that uh, what we observed was just due to chance. So we'll also take a look at this bottom uh, table as well. Okay, so focusing on the top table, the descriptive statistics, you'll see that there's three columns uh, that are labeled, the observed uh, number, the expected number, and the residual. The observed number, as was mentioned, tells us what we observed uh, based upon our data collection. 16 people saying yes and 4 people saying no to the question, do you work? The expected in uh, is what we'd expect based upon the null hypothesis. And as you recall, the null hypothesis was that uh, only half the people would be working. So out of 20, uh, half would be 10 uh, who should say yes, and the other half, the other 10, would say no. Finally, the last column is residual, and that's the difference between the observed and the expected. So in terms of the people who said yes, we observed 16. Only 10 were expected to say yes. Six more said yes than had been expected. In terms of the no response, we observed four people saying no. Ten people were expected to say no. We saw six less people than expected uh, saying no. So the residual is how big of a difference was there between what we observed and what was expected based upon the null hypothesis. The larger the residual, the more confident we can be that this is a real difference and not just some chance fluctuation, you know, in terms of we happen to just pick a, a sample where more people work than normal or less than less people work than normal. So we want a big residual if we want to reject our null hypothesis. Well, we gotta stop for a moment and we gotta consider that third requirement to do a chi square test. As you recall, the first requirement was random sampling uh, to achieve the goal of a representative sample to allow us to generalize to the population. The second requirement was that the values for our variable, our variable is do you work, our values were yes and no, that those values would be mutually exclusive. And the third requirement was that the expected value for each cell, that is each category, has to at least be five. Uh, again, if it isn't five, um, well, that can make our results uh, less uh, of value in terms of uh, making sense of the data. Uh, taking a look at our top table, we can see that the expected uh, number of people saying yes and the expected number of people saying no was 10 in both cases. Uh, looking at the bottom table, uh, at footnote A, it says uh, zero cells have expected frequencies less than five. That's good. We, uh, that means we're meeting that third requirement. In fact, the minimum expected cell frequency is 10. So it says you're clear to move forward. Okay, so looking at that bottom table more closely, uh, you'll see that there's three rows. There's the chi-square row, uh, which is the value of your chi-square analysis. Uh, there is the DF for degrees of freedom, and then there is ASIM significance, and that, that's our p-value. That top row, chi-square, and notice that I have a fancy-looking x uh, squared, and uh, the value for the chi-square is 7.2. The larger that value, the more likely we'll be able to reject the null hypothesis. For degrees of freedom, it's equal to 1, and our degrees of freedom is calculated as the number of categories minus 1. 
Well, how many categories did we have? We had, uh, well, people could respond either yes or no. So we had two categories. So number of categories minus one, we had two categories, two minus one, that's one. Our degrees of freedom is one. And SPSS tells us that. Finally, the asymptotic significance, that's our p-value. That is, okay, so we observed a, a difference between uh, the expected and, and the actual observed frequencies. What's the probability that could just be due to chance? Well, um, if, there, if in the population of all students, half worked and half did not, and if we randomly sampled 20 students from that population, the probability of us getting 16 people saying, yes, I work, and four people saying, no, I don't, just due to chance, is 0 0.007, less than 1%, a very small probability of this occurring due to chance. So if the null hypothesis was right, that really, in the whole population, 50% people work and 50% people don't, we could get this sample with this large difference, but it would only happen due to chance 0.007 of the time. Uh, importantly, the probability of this happening due to chance, uh, 0.007, is less than or equal to our alpha level of 0.05. So we're going to be able to reject the null hypothesis. So the asymptotic significance, that's our p-value, and we want it to be less than 0.05. At the bottom of the screen, you'll see chi-square 1 equal 7.20, p less than or equal to 0.05. And this information is written in this exact format. This is our APA format for how we'd write up the result. And it is taken from that bottom table, giving us our inferential statistics. We have chi-square, in parentheses we put the degrees of freedom, which was 1. We say what it's equal to, and that's where we put in the actual chi-square value, and that was 7.20. In terms of probability, we're either going to say p less than or equal to 0.05, because 0.05 is our alpha level. And if p is less than or equal to 0.05, we get to reject the null, which is a wonderful thing because that would only mean you get to publish your results. In this particular scenario, it means that the students could tell their instructor, hey, way more than half of us work. Please be kinder on the homework. And the instructor might say, well, hey, this homework is very necessary for you to learn the material, but some negotiation could perhaps take place. If the uh, probability is greater than 0.05, well, then the probability is happening due to chance uh, is greater than the 0.05 and so we're not willing to say that it's a real thing and in that case we would retain the null. So a probability is less than or equal to 0.05, we reject, we say, ah, oh, probability is happening due to chance is so small, I'm not going to go along with that possibility, instead I'll say something real is taking place. If probability is greater than 0.05 then we will retain that null hypothesis. Okay, and then here you can see how someone might write up the results of what we've been looking at in terms of the SPS output. So we could say, we sampled 20 students, right? We're letting our reader know how many people were in the survey. And that's going to be important uh, because we're dealing with frequencies here. Frequency of people who said yes and frequency of people who said no. So we sampled 20 students and evaluated whether the number of students who work, and there we're letting our reader know how many people work, F, because that's frequency, and notice that it's italicized, is equal to 16, was equal to the number of students uh, who do not work. And again, we have F italicized is equal to 4. So our first sentence says we sampled 20 students and evaluate whether the number of students who work, F equals 16, was equal to the number of students who do not work. F was equal to 4. That tells us what we were evaluating, uh, whether there was the same number of people who would work as who did not work. We also told our reader what we actually observed. 16 work, 4 do not. The data was analyzed using a chi-square goodness of fit test. Right? We're letting our reader know what statistical tests, what inferential statistical tests that is, that we used to analyze our data. The null hypothesis was rejected. And here we give our reader uh, the inferential uh, statistical test results. Chi-square, one degree of freedom, that's put in the parentheses, is equal to, and then the chi-square value, 7.20, comma, and then that p was less than or equal to 0.05, saying, hey, the probability of this was less than alpha, so again, we get to reject the null. 
Finally, our last sentence just puts it out there in, in everyday understandable English. More than half the students at the college also work. Okay, hope that this was helpful. And again, this is uh, a presentation be focusing on how do you interpret the SPS output for chi-square and then write it up with the APA style.